This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with Hajun Chang, who is at SOAS University of London. Uh, I guess you are officially an economist, but uh, <laughs> you're also an historian, <laughs> right? You've yep. got a lot of different hats, and we'll have to dive Thank into you. those different yeah. hats. But you're also the author of a, a number of books. Uh, the most recent book, which yeah. um, I think at some point in the book you say that it is a very strange book. <laughs> it is a strange is. book. And that one is called um, Edible Economics, A Hungry Economist Explains the World. But, of course, we've got a whole bunch of other ones. This one, I, I, you know, this is a real gem. I'm, I'm going to have to figure out a way to assign this. It's called Economics, The User's Guide. Um, and then... Uh, 23 things they don't tell you about capitalism. I think this came out right after the financial crisis. That's right. Um, yeah. Then you got an older one called Bad Samaritans, which mm -hmm. I think this was kind of your first book that was targeting a, a broader audience. Exactly, and then, yeah. yeah. And then this one, I think is your first book. Uh, it's called Kicking Away the Ladder, Development Strategy in Historical Perspective, which takes you to your roots as sort of a, a development uh, economist. Uh -huh. I guess that's that's sort of <laughs> that's your, right. your, your yeah. core. Yeah. So w welcome, Hajun. Well, thank you for having me. So in a number of your books, um, mm. you make some interesting points. One of the points is that you don't need a professional to understand mm -hmm. economics. You know, you, you can, you can yeah. kind of figure it out yourself. And, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like the, the book on cooking because, you know, everyone can be a cook. You don't have to be, yeah. you don't have to go to Cordon Bleu to become a, a cook. And, and I guess you don't have to go to University of London and get a PhD to become uh, an, right. an economist, yeah. um, and, and I was I was in the Uber yesterday, and mm. this guy asked me. He's picking me up from work, and he's like, mm -hmm. what, "What what do you do?" And I said I was an economist, mm. and he said, "Well, you know, what is that?" And mm. and like, what do you guys study? And I said, "Well, mm. we study everything about human behavior." <laughs> and then <laughs> in your book, you say, "No, no, 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 right? <laughs> Economics <laughs> is, is about the economy." <laughs> It's, it's not about everything. So, so how do you reconcile those two things? Because I think when when I was when I was when I was reading the mm -mm. The, the edible economics book, mm -mm. You, you took a little bit more of an expansive view uh, yeah. about how economics can inform everything, even uh -huh. sort of just uh -huh. you know when you when you buy your food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, thank you. No, that, 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 that there are quite a few threads uh, that in what you have just said, uh, which is uh, wonderful. Uh, yeah, first of all, I think uh, that you know I keep uh, saying that uh, you don't have to be a professional economist in order to understand the economy, that this is not to devalue professional training, you know. I mean, th th the point is that we can have understanding of things at different levels, you know. Mm -hmm. So the, the, there are things that only trained professionals can understand, but that doesn't mean that other people cannot understand the, the main points of uh, economic arguments or that words that, that they shouldn't try to because I, I, I have uh, been on a kind of uh, the personal crusade uh, which may be kind of uh, described as a mass economic literacy campaign mm -hmm. because I uh, have but uh, over time realized that in a capitalist uh, society unless everyone understands some economics uh, democracy is meaningless yeah? mm -hmm. Because so many of things are bound up in economic decisions, whether it's about the teaching of uh, the ancient languages in universities or preservation of uh, cultural heritage. You know, I I've even met some British people who try to defend uh, the monarchy by arguing that it brings in tourist revenue. You know, I'm not a monarchist, but what a demeaning, <laughs> what a demeaning way about that. Uh, Defending an institution that that uh, is supposed to be at the foundation of your society, it's come to that. So mm -hmm. you know, unless you understand economics, you don't uh, actually understand how the world works now. Mm -hmm. And that uh, that because uh, people don't do that uh, in elections, uh, that you are you know back in two thousand, a lot of people in America voted for George W. Bush, uh, saying that he uh, looks like a kind of guy that you could have beer with, yeah. Yeah. You know, on that qualification, I could have become the president of the U.S. You know, I can appear with anyone. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, that unless we want to reduce uh, the the democratic uh, politics uh, to basically that uh, talent show, you know, that that, that mm -hmm. everyone needs to understand some economics. Yeah? 
So that, uh, I've been uh, trying to uh, write all this uh, the stuff about uh, the how we can understand the economy and uh, how it is not uh, the, the only the professions that uh, the can understand it. Now, the, having said that, yes, I mean, the, the economics uh, the is, uh, in a way, impinging on everything. So that uh, means that uh, the, when you talk about uh, economics, you actually get to talk about other things too. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So the, I, I, I the, try to define economics as the, the study of the economy, not the application of economic logic to everything. There's a slight distinction between these two, which uh, the, may, be, may sound like a very the, the small, but it isn't, because the one view says uh, that you know, the, 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 the more widespread view uh, the says uh, that economics is about the way of thinking. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I mean, the rational choice, you know, how the, the people the, the make a choice uh, the, on the constraints and so on. The, the, the other view that I'm advocating is, is a study of the economy, whether it the, the is about the rational choice or the, the, the I don't know, economics of uh, irrational wars or the, the, about the other aspects of uh, the, 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 our the material provision. Yeah? So the, there's a slight distinction here, but uh, which actually is uh, the, the, in, in the end very important. But you know what uh, I, I would uh, the, like to say in this uh, regard is that uh, you know the, it's uh, one thing to say that the uh, economy has uh, implications for other things. It's another to say that economics is basically everything. Yeah? Yeah. So the the latter view, I the, the think that uh, is uh, problematic because uh, the, when this uh, view becomes dominant, as it is uh, in many societies these days, I mean that uh, you basically the, the naturally the get to sub subject all the other areas uh, to economic logic, yeah? which I think is that uh, not a healthy thing, you know, that, that these uh, different spheres of life uh, that have to have uh, different uh, kind of uh, the domains and uh, the different logics and uh, different priorities. But uh, that by saying that economics is uh, the supreme logic, we are actually forcing all these other things uh, the second mm -hmm. uh, to be secondary to, uh, to the calculations of uh, the, the profit and the prices and so on. And I, I don't think it's that, that that is actually a healthy thing. Well, I think, I think you might be selling yourself short because I think you also in the book are making the point. So it's not just that in order to be an informed voter and a good participant in society, you need to understand economics. But I think it, what, what you're arguing is that it can unlock a sense of wonder uh, about the ordinary mm -hmm. in life, right? So, I mean, the book, oh, the book yeah. Edible Economics, you know, you have a chapter, each chapter is on a, on a, on a different food. And, you know, you, you start by talking about the food and then before you know it, you know, yeah. you're talking about development, international <laughs> trade and stuff. And, and I think it, it gives me a little, it gives a little window into your brain, right? Cause you know, you open uh -uh. a refrigerator, you see some garlic and then your, your mind just takes off, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, so this, this analogy, you make a couple of interesting analogies between cooking and economics, yeah, yeah, which I, yeah. which I love because I, I love both, right. both fields as well. And, and, mm. you know, one of them is that, you know, you can be an amateur cook, mm -hmm. but you know, the other is that, um, you know, economics needs to be more about, uh, sourcing from different places, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you described when you exactly. came to, when you came to to England from Korea, you, you described well. There's two things. First of all, you had a very very limited palate, which was very yeah. Korean, and the it's English right. had had extremely <laughs> limited palate. You, you called it kind yeah, of even more uh, limited. Yeah. yeah this way. <laughs> but now you, you know in in, in England, um, you, you can get Indian, you can get Korean, you can get Chinese, you can get world class oh, yeah. anything. And so while the world has become so much more curious mm -hmm. about things like food, you argue that yeah. in the domain of economics, we've kind of you know, become less curious or more you know, right, mono, yeah. monocropping, you call yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. No, I mean, that, that uh, has been uh, quite an uh, experience. I mean, you know, uh, when I first uh, came to Britain in 1986, uh, British food culture is so conservative. I mean, that. Uh, anything that remotely sounds foreign that they would need yeah i mean the, the for me at least uh, the epitome of that uh, conservatism was this uh, pizza chain called pizza land which gave customers an option to have their pizzas uh, topped 
but uh, with uh, the potatoes, <laughs> baked potato. I yeah, like that sounds so good. It's like yeah, yeah. No, I mean uh, I have uh, nothing against it, but yeah, you know the the thinking behind it was basically well, if you cannot deal with this uh, strange uh, foreign food uh, called pizza. We are giving you a security blanket or hold on to your potatoes, yeah, and that uh, everything will be fine, yeah. But uh, <laughs> my theory is that uh, sometime in the late 1990s, uh, the Brit British people had a collective epiphany. Yeah? Mm -hmm. They realized that their food really sucks, yeah. And once they did that, actually, they became completely open minded, you know. Once you abandon your own food, you know, why should you? prefer Mexican over Korean or the prefer Turkish over Indian, you know, anything uh, tastes fine. So the, the, as a result, uh, now Britain has become one of the most uh, exciting places uh, to eat mm -hmm. uh, in. I mean, the, the, you can, as you said, uh, get anything of uh, the world-class uh, standard. And yeah, British food itself uh, has been upgraded because it uh, had the... Uh, has absorbed uh, all these uh, different influences. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been the fusions. Uh, you know, the, I, I, someone uh, told me that uh, the, in the, 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 the British uh, city of Birmingham, there's a restaurant which sells uh, fusion Korean Peruvian food, you know? <laughs> oh my God, you know, the Peruvian food itself is a fusion of, uh, the, you know, mm -hmm. Spanish food and Inca food and uh, Chinese food and Japanese food because they had a lot of indentured laborers that are from Japan and China in the late 19th, early 20th century and mix uh, the Korean food into that, mm -hmm. you know, the, the mind boggles, you know. Unfortunately, during this uh, period, uh, the reverse has been happening to my other world, that is the world of economics. You know, until the 70s, you had, you know, nine, ten uh, major schools of uh, economics, you know, it, could have been that, that 20 if you included some of the smaller schools, uh, split some of the big schools to sub schools, and all these different schools were kind of uh, that, uh, proud of uh, their own traditions, mm -hmm. but uh, had to confront that, uh, each other, you know, that, uh, compete, you know, sometimes that, 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 that kind of in a death match, yeah, like uh, that, the debate between the, the, the Austrians and the Marxists in the 1920s and 30s. You know, sometimes uh, in a more the, the, the reasonable the conversation from uh, the, the, which uh, the, the, they all the, learn new things. You know, people uh, try the fusion theories. You know, the, some some people that the, try to mix uh, the Keynes' theory and Marxist theory. Yeah, in the, the 1970s, you know, and it was uh, really exciting, like the British uh, scene of. Uh, food scene of today. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, since the 80s, one school has uh, become dominant, this school called neoclassical economics. And, you know, I'm not saying that uh, that school is uh, particularly bad, you know, the, the, like all other schools, it has some tremendous uh, strength and uh, some very important insights, but uh, it uh, the also has uh, shortcomings. You know? I mean, all theories are like that because they were all developed in a particular context in order to study particular aspects of the economy. Yeah? So the neoclassical economics uh, is a theory of uh, market exchange, yeah? mm -hmm. essentially. You know, whereas uh, the, the classical schools, uh, the Marxist schools, they are more interested in, say, production. Yeah? I mean, they all had uh, different theories of how the economy uh, develops, uh, how it uh, the seeks its uh, balance. Yeah? And they all have uh, different uh, political and ethical assumptions. So each theory is uh, very good at explaining some things and uh, not very good at explaining the, uh, the, the others. You know? So the, 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 this means that uh, dominance by one school means that our intellectual diet uh, uh, has become poorer yeah? because that, uh, we now operate with one theory, which is uh, good at uh, doing some things, but not good at doing other things. Yeah? Well, now, now this is a very provocative thought, right? Because this is kind mm -hmm. of saying that, you know, we should view something like economics more like, you know, art than, than science in a way, right? Oh, because, absolutely, yeah. Because, in, you know, in the world of science, I don't think anybody would be comfortable with this idea mm -hmm. that, well, you know, there's, there's, mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's the Newtonian view, and then there's the Einstein view, and you know, right. and they're they're both mm -hmm. equally good. Or yeah, yeah. you know, there's Lamarck, and there's Darwin, mm -hmm. and well, yeah. you know, they're they're just different ways of looking at the yeah, world. Yeah. No, like yeah, we yeah. we want to figure out how to 
blend and merge into a single view of things, right? And, exactly, and yeah. you know, if, if, yeah. if electromagnetism and gravity don't mm-hmm. seem consistent, that's a problem mm-hmm. we want to solve. But I think you're yes, kind of certainly. saying that economics is different. You know, you, yeah. you, you, you want to keep the, these, these separate schools. Now, would that, is that, is that another way of saying that the different schools or approaches might be like, you know, different keys for different locks that, you know, they, they, they solve different problems or is it that, Mm-mm. you know, none of them can on their own individually uh, solve any specific problem and that ultimately you need to approach them from different perspectives. Yeah. No, no, that, that's a very the, the, the elegant way of uh, putting it. You know, well, basically my view is that uh, the, the world is uh, too complex, too uncertain and uh, human beings are so unpredictable that uh, we cannot have uh, the economics that uh, that is uh, scientific in the same way that uh, physics or chemistry that uh, is, you know, just think about it, you know, that that, the subatomic particles do not say that, well, according to the theory, I'm supposed to behave in this way, but I'm not going to do that because it's unethical, yeah? You know, chemical molecules do not say, well, we are always, uh, have always been moving in this way, but wouldn't the world be a better place if we went the other way, you know? Mm-hmm. That's what humans do. So that, uh, you know, that, that embedded uh, in human society are different uh, visions of uh, what uh, is a good society, different ethical standards, you know, the different uh, political positions. So this uh, makes it impossible to that, uh, turn economics into science in the way the physics and chemistry are. And actually, if you look at the, the real world, the all the successful the countries, have been basically pragmatic countries that uh, didn't stick to the, a particular ideology and did uh, the, whatever was uh, necessary the, given their view of uh, what is a good society. So the, the ultimate example of this uh, is uh, Singapore. You know, the, when you read about Singapore in the standard economics books and uh, the financial press, uh, you will only hear about this uh, free trade policy and this uh, welcoming attitude towards uh, uh, foreign investors, which it has. But you will never be told that 90% of land in Singapore is owned by the government. Yeah? Mm-hmm. You will never be told that 85% of housing is supplied by the government-owned housing corporation. And a staggering 22% of GDP is produced by state-owned enterprises, or what uh, they call in that country government-linked corporations, GLCs. Yeah? So I often challenge my graduate students, look, Give me one economic theory. It doesn't matter what it is, that uh, neoclassical, Keynesian, Schumpeterian, Austrian. Give me one economic theory that can explain Singapore single-handedly. I bet that, that, that this is uh, that impossible. Yeah? You, that there's no such theory. Yeah? Because uh, Singapore is uh, the product of uh, very uh, concrete, uh, pragmatic human decisions trying to that, that, uh, survive in you know, a very particular conditions. You know, I mean, it's a uh, city-state with very limited land, so they realize that however much uh, they might uh, believe in that uh, free trade, I mean, that you cannot have uh, free trade in land because uh, that, that, that will lead to that uh, concentration of ownership and uh, there will be political instability, which will uh, basically that, that destroy the economy. Yeah? So they had to do that. Yeah? I mean, if uh, they were ideological like uh, the Soviet Union was, you know, I mean, they would have uh, said, no, we are free market economy, we are uh, not going to, yeah. You know, land is also that, uh, mostly owned by the government in Hong Kong, you know, that uh, even during the that, uh, British uh, colonial rule, it was uh, because in this uh, city states, I mean, unless you uh, that, uh, stabilize the land situation, that you don't have uh, that, uh, any chance of uh, that, uh, survival, yeah. So, you know, that, in this sense, I'm uh, a great uh, the believer of uh, the uh, what uh, uh, the former Chinese leader, Mr. Deng Xiaoping, said, uh, he famously said that I don't care whether the cat is black or white as far as it catches mice. Yeah? Mm-hmm. So well, that, that our that, 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 that goal, that our that, that mice catching should be the building a good society. Of course, that, that, that it has to be debated exactly what you mean by that. And so on, yeah? Building a good society with uh, everyone is uh, taken care of, everyone has a that, uh, opportunity that, to develop themselves yeah, and that, that we that collectively prosper. And to achieve that, that you might need that, that different uh, policies, different uh, the theoretical tools and different schools of economics. 
because uh, the, they all have uh, the, their strengths and weaknesses, and uh, they they have blind spots and uh, you know shortcomings. Uh, the, so yeah, I mean that even if you in the end that uh, prefer one approach, I mean knowing other approaches uh, that would be great. You know, you know I mean that, that if you only knew I don't know that uh, Mexican food or Thai food, I mean that you don't uh, believe that, that that there could be nice food uh, without chili. You know. <laughs> Well, how do these schools differ from models, right? So, you know, it's, it's within the neoclassical school, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, you learn about, say, a prisoner's dilemma, and then you learn about yeah. a lemon's problem, and mm-hmm. then, you know, you learn about this, and you, all these different models. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's no economist within the neoclassical school who would say mm-hmm. the whole world is a prisoner's dilemma. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. They're going to say, well, you know, that helps you to describe yeah. certain scenarios. And, and then what your job as the economist is to kind of figure out which model yeah. does the best job of explaining, right, yeah. the phenomenon you're studying. But it seems like at the level of a school, right, um, economists don't think that way. They don't say, well, you know, this situation is best explained by the neoclassical you know, mm-hmm. school and, and this, this exactly, one is yeah. better explained by yeah. the Kate. Like that's not usually yeah. how it works. So that's it, right. No, no, that's why, why don't we, yeah, tr- why? Why it, uh, one group of things are called schools and the other groups that, 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 that are called uh, models. Yeah. You know, I mean, the other schools uh, use uh, models too, you know, the Marxists have their own models, uh, Keynesians have to, they have their own models, you know, even that the uh, Austrian school, the, which uh, usually is uh, the verbally presented without the uh, mathematical equations, has that uh, implicit uh, model, yeah. So we are uh, talking about the uh, differences in model, but the uh, the uh, the differences between schools uh, comes from more fundamental things like uh, say ethical assumptions, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that uh, for example, in the, 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 if you belong to the say Marxist school, that you that uh, say that the, the the interest of the entire working class is uh, the supreme mm-hmm. goal. And individuals that, that, that can be that, that sacrifice, yeah. Neoclassical economists would accept that. So they would argue that, you know, that, that you can call a social change an improvement only if it hurts no one, mm-hmm. yeah, while making some people better off, yeah. But then you could criticize that as well, that, because that, that when you accept uh, that uh, philosophical position, you basically have to uh, accept whatever the, the inequality and un- injustice uh, that exists in society, because uh, if uh, the you know the the, the rich, rich uh, the elite that uh, refuse to give away even a small fraction of their income to save uh, the starving uh, children, you have to accept it because that uh, you cannot uh, take things away from uh, the, some people without their consent. Yeah. So that uh, these are the kind of very the fundamental the, the ethical mm. differences. Also, they have uh, different models about uh, the, the sorry theories about uh, how the economy behaves. Yeah. So, the, for example, in the neoclassical theory, the competition mainly happens uh, through uh, prices. Yeah. So you the increase your efficiency, you the offer the cheaper things, you win the market share. You know. Joseph Schumpeter, the, the founder of uh, the Schumpeterian school, argued that that kind of competition, of course, that uh, is uh, important, but uh, it's uh, like, uh, say, some someone forcing a door, the, you know, say, urban of warfare. Yeah? And uh, my theory of innovation, my the, the theory that the, the competition mainly happens uh, through innovation, yeah. is uh, like an uh, aerial bombardment. Yeah? I mean... Uh, <laughs> This uh, price competition is that uh, that uh, I mean uh, so insignificant uh, compared to what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. This is not the uh, uh, how the economy works, yeah. So you know, uh, these are some very fundamental uh, differences in the outlook. You know, the, also neoclassical the, the school assumes that uh, human beings are fundamentally the rational, yeah, mm-hmm. and usually selfish, yeah. I mean, the behavioralists, uh, the institutionalists, uh, they would argue that no, human beings are far more complex. Yeah, they have uh, multiple motives. You know, that some economists that uh, have debated this issue of multiple self. Yeah, so that uh, within our own brain, uh, there are like uh, three yeah different guys living. I mean, yeah, that the, the many the Disney uh, cut the, the animations have about the, the angels standing on one the, the shoulder. Yeah. 
they were standing on another, yeah? Uh, the, we had the complex, yeah? And uh, the, they would argue that uh, the, there's no such thing as uh, the human nature as it is assumed in neoclassical economics because we are all products of uh, history, particular cultures and so on. So the, the, it's uh, the, the impossible to say that the, the, this or that is uh, the human nature. Yeah? So once again, I mean, the, 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 these are debatable things, you know. I mean, I'm not saying that one is uh, necessarily correct and uh, the others are necessarily the, the, the incorrect, but, you know, these are big uh, the, the differences in the, 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 the fundamental outlook, which are not about, you know, exactly how you model things, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, how do you how do you explain this? I mean, you know, we we understand how the you know the Cavendish banana you know took over, and like every banana is is the same, and there's like you know eight hundred <laughs> types types of bananas. But but you know, th- how did this process occur? I mean, why did how did these schools get squeezed out? I mean, I teach Mm-mm. when I teach um, innovation, I, I realize that I'm I'm actually channeling you know Schumpeter, and when yeah, I teach yeah. behavioral finance, I realize I'm cha- channeling you know the behavioralist stuff. When exactly, I cha- yeah. when I teach uh, you know uh, microeconomics. I'm, I'm doing neoclassical stuff, and yeah, and true. and so you know, and maybe business schools are a little bit more pluralistic. But but um, uh, they are, yeah. But but how did how did this happen? I mean, how, mm. I mean, and and is it is it just the nature of the way in which academics are rewarded? Is it is it the nature, or is there or is it more to do with a, Is there a bigger picture here? And I think you know you yeah. argue that that there's this. And there's this tie between normativity mm-hmm. and positivity. So this is that the, your by economists are are you know they're not engaging in pure intellectual exercises trying to explain the world, but that mm-hmm. there are these policy implications. And maybe that's right. Yeah. You know, you, you start with the policy and then work backwards. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, is is it is it that? Is it like the the normativity of, of the uh-huh. Washington yeah, consensus yeah. that kind of you know created a demand for this type mm-hmm. of of thinking, or is it more you know just the logic of academic specialization? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think uh, there are uh, many different uh, things uh, working here. The, but uh, you know, the, someone uh, told me that the the, the reason why the, the United States has that. Uh, freedom of speech uh, embedded in his uh, uh, constitution uh, is uh, because uh, without uh, people actually willing to express uh, different opinions, democracy uh, withers, you know, because that, uh, you know, that we all have uh, the herd instinct, you know, if uh, someone gets powerful, we that, that, that just uh, tend to accept uh, whatever that person is saying. So it, uh, you deliberately need to uh, 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 create uh, uh, disputes and debate uh, in order to uh, uh, have a healthy uh, democracy. And I think it's uh, a very important uh, point. Yeah? So in the academia, that, uh, that unless you make uh, deliberate attempts uh, that, uh, to have a diversity of opinion, it uh, that, uh, will uh, become uh, homogenized. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Because that, uh, it's that, I mean, that if uh, that, uh, you have uh, that different groups with fundamentally different outlook and uh, that if you let that uh, one group uh, that decide who's uh, a good one the dominant group uh, in the former Soviet countries it was the Marxist yeah so that uh, there the people might study neoclassical economics uh, Keynesian economics but uh, only to criticize them yeah because that uh, you have to be Marxist yeah mm-hmm. in the capitalist uh, the countries uh, that uh, for Various reasons uh, that I cannot uh, 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 fully go into. I'll, I'll mention one or two reasons. Neoclassical school has uh, 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 became dominant, and then once it became dominant, it uh, started uh, pushing out all the schools because, uh, the, the, from their point of view, the, these other schools are, you know, not even economics, yeah, or a very sloppy way of thinking, yeah. Because that, that, that you that think that, that there's that there's one particular right way of uh, the, doing research on the economy, and that, that if you that don't follow that, that you are not that, that qualified. Yeah. So that, unfortunately, there's that, 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 this uh, the homogenizing uh, the tendency in the, uh, the academia, but also that the reason why the neoclassical school has become uh, quite dominant is uh, because it that. that is uh, the, the, the kinder to uh, 
the existing social order than the other schools. You know, the, for example, you know, the, the going back a bit in the U.S. Uh, until the 1930s and 40s, actually the dominant school of economics was not neoclassical school. It was the institutionalist school. You know, mm -hmm. you know people that uh, wrongly say that, oh, the New Deal was a Keynesian policy. No, New Deal was not Keynesian. It was uh, the, the basically inspired by the, the American institutionalist school, followers of uh, the, the Norwegian American the economist Thorstein Bevelin, yeah? John Commons, I think. Yeah, and the uh, uh, Commons and Wesley Mitchell and these people. And uh, if you look at the, actually the, the, the New Deal the, the policies, okay, there was a bit of deficit spending, but it wasn't about uh, macroeconomics. It was about institutional reform, yeah? So there was the Social Security Act, uh, there was the Wagner Act, uh, which uh, uh, gave uh, power to the trade unions, you know, that uh, you had the uh, glass Steagall, which uh, separated uh, the investment banks uh, from commercial banks, you know, and, and uh, 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 you, you set up uh, uh, the, the, the security, uh, uh, the Securities uh, Commission, yeah. So it was uh, the, the institutional reform, and you know, the neoclassical economics is uh, not that keen on institutional reform, not to speak of, you know, Marxist the, the, the class the, the war and revolution, because uh, the, as I said earlier, I mean, their philosophy, which is known as uh, the, this uh, the Pareto, the uh, idea of uh, Pareto optimality and Pareto improvement, is uh, based on this notion that uh, you cannot uh, the call the a social change that uh, hurts anyone on improvement. Yeah? Now, this is a very important uh, principle that uh, to defend the uh, individual rights against uh, the tyranny of the majority. Yeah? Because uh, if you're not careful, if you begin to say, well, the, we are doing this uh, for the greater good, yeah? so uh, why can't we sacrifice one person yeah? for the, 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 the benefit of 8 billion people? Yeah? A lot of people will say, yes, uh, we should do that. Yeah? But what if uh, that one person becomes uh, 10,000 and uh, 1 million and 10 million? Yeah? So, I mean, this uh, Pareto uh, uh, idea is uh, that, uh, very important uh, the defense against uh, the tyranny of majority. But as I said earlier, I mean, uh, it uh, is a fundamentally very conservative uh, the, the view of the world yeah? because you basically accept the existing distribution of income, wealth, and power and then you uh, try to see whether you can improve things uh, within that framework, yeah? without hurting anyone. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So this uh, the, is uh, quite a the, the comforting approach to the world, the, 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 to the elite who benefit uh, from this status quo. And I think that the, the, uh, the, that was another reason why, uh, instead, of, uh, the, in addition to the, the logic mm -hmm. of uh, the academic uh, the, ideological uh, homogenization, that, that was another reason why this uh, school got uh, so much support. You know? uh, once uh, the, the, in the 80s, the so-called neoliberal the mm -hmm. revolution happened and you know, the, the, the ruling elite, that, uh, which uh, had been kind of, uh, more careful that, uh, in what they do that because of uh, the mm -hmm. uh, confrontation with the Soviet Union, the rise of the trade union movement, when they got the upper hand, uh, they basically didn't want to that, that hear too many things uh, that were mm. criticizing the status quo. So that this is another important reason why neoclassical uh, school became so dominant. Well, I mean, there's, there's a bit of a cynical view in your work where, mm -hmm. you know, Keynes said that we're all kind of slaves to some prior generation of economists. Mm -mm. But I think you're, you're implying that, you know, economists may be slave to you know, political economy, right? In the <laughs> sense that, you know, there, there's a, there's a, there's a demand for certain ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, your book that you wrote right after the financial crisis, you know, I think Im implied that, and I certainly remember right before the financial crisis, mm -hmm. I mean, anybody who was in the world of finance, you know, we, we all had, you know, justifications and explanations for why, you know, un unfettered, mm -hmm. you know, deregulated financial markets uh, were, were such a great thing. Yeah. Now, you know, presumably they're, they're now it's not to say that economists are in the pay of, you know, big banks or anything no, like no, that. No. And it's, and it's not to say that, you know, if you're a tenured professor writing articles mm -hmm. for the AER, you're in, you're in, you're in the pay of, you know, the, the, 
the, the people who benefit from globalization. No, no, but but I, but I think mm-hmm. but I think you know there, there's there's something to that, mm-hmm. right? I mean, when when we look at and and let's turn maybe to your discussion of development economics. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you wrote this book called. Uh, kicking kicking away the ladder, yeah. right? <laughs> which which is sort of you know once a country becomes developed, y- you're arguing that they they kind of try to prevent the other countries uh, that haven't yet developed from mm-hmm. becoming developed mm-hmm. and and denying them the um you, you in, yeah the discouraging uh, from them have, yeah have yeah. used uh, themselves yeah and you talk about the mm-hmm. Washington consensus mm-hmm. now what what. How would it, so so th- this would imply that the the developed world benefits in some way mm-hmm. from you know preventing the developed world from joining them in, in in the ranks. I was wondering if you could dig into this a little bit and and how does a historical view Mm-mm. help you to better understand? You, you talk about development economics and economic history and how they're kind of two sides yeah. of the same coin. I've always oh. thought that I I was motivated to study um, history by an interest in development economics. Great, great, yeah. No, the 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 book uh, kicking the ladder the the puts uh, our current uh, development uh, discussion into historical perspective. Yeah, so the, at least in the last uh, the forty years, uh, the prevailing uh, view has been that uh, you know the free trade, the uh, deregulated markets, uh, the you know the uh, prevalence of uh, the the private ownership. You know, these are things uh, that are good for economic development. Yeah? Uh, but uh, when you look at uh, the history of today's rich countries, you find that uh, they use almost exact opposite what, of uh, what they were recommending. You know, the, in the 18th century, when the Britain was uh, still a second-rate economy, the relying on the uh, export of uh, raw materials, uh, the, namely the wool, the, to the then the, the manufacturing, uh, high tech manufacturing uh, center of uh, Europe, uh, the low country, what uh, the Belgium and the Netherlands are today, which was uh, the, 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 the center of uh, the woolen manufacturing. I mean, that uh, basically Britain had to uh, introduce a lot of uh, protectionism to protect uh, the weaker domestic yeah. producers that, uh, from uh, superior foreign producers, uh, gave a lot of subsidies to these guys. Yeah? And then uh, when the, the, the they became uh, the, the world's uh, top uh, industrial nation, it started uh, preaching free trade uh, to other countries. Yeah? So this uh, the passage, uh, the kicking of the ladder, comes from the 19th century German economist, uh, the Friedrich List, who said, uh, look, at the, the British uh, tell us the Germans and the Americans uh, the 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 two countries that are uh, very much identified with each other at the time uh, the, to practice free trade. But uh, when you look at the uh, British history, when did they uh, start uh, practicing uh, free trade? Only after the country became uh, the dominant industrial power. Yeah? So this is like uh, someone that uh, using a, that, uh, a ladder to climb to the top and kicking that ladder away that, uh, so that other people cannot reach the top. Yeah? And uh, very interestingly, that uh, it wasn't the uh, list uh, who I- invented uh, the, this uh, theory known as a uh, uh, theory of uh, infant industry protection, namely the argument that uh, the governments of uh, economically backward nations uh, need to protect and nurture their new industries in the same way that we protect and nurture our children until they uh, grow up and can compete in the other labor market, the guy who invented that theory was known other than the very first uh, finance minister or what uh, you guys called the uh, treasury secretary of the United States of America, Alexander Hamilton. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, the Hamilton the, the actually the, the wrote the, this uh, the famous uh, report uh, called the report on the subject of manufacture the, by the treasury secretary. The, and he submitted uh, to the U.S. Congress and, you know, I that, that, that say that that was uh, the very first systematic development planning document in human history. Yeah? Mm-hmm. No, the guy was amazing. I mean, yeah, I mean, he was uh, the, 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 as far as that uh, we can tell from, you know, the, 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 the musical that uh, he was uh, that, uh, <laughs> uh, kind of arrogant bastard. But, uh, the, you know, the, in terms of his economics, he was uh, brilliant because uh, the, he was not just uh, talking about uh, protecting 
what he called the uh, industries in their infancy uh, against uh, the British and other European competition. He was uh, talking about uh, the development of a uh, government bond market. You know, he was uh, the, the talking about the, the establishing some kind of central bank. You know? I mean, he was uh, talking about the patent system, the investment in infrastructure. You know, so that he he that the, the came up with this uh, vision of uh, the uh, economic development, which uh, that uh, was uh, actually repeatedly used by other countries. You know, the, the late 19th century Germany, Sweden. You know, uh, later in the 20th century, that the France. Yeah, you know, Japan, Korea, Taiwan. Yeah, which are uh, basically called for the use of uh, active uh, government uh, intervention. You know, the, the trade protection. You know, regulation against the uh, foreign the uh, investment. You know, the uh, investment in the, the excuse me the, the infrastructure. You know, the violation of the, the, the intellectual property rights because uh, the, as a uh, nation uh, trying to catch up, you need to the, basically steal technologies the, the, from others. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I mean the the, the, the the historical record is actually the amazing. I mean, the, almost every country, at least for substantial period of uh, the the, the early development used uh, the, such policies mm -hmm. but then now the so-called uh, Washington consensus uh, the, the says that the, you shouldn't uh, use those policies you know that the Charles Kindleberg the, the, the eminent the, the economic historian the, who uh, the wrote the, the endorsement for my book uh, kicking the ladder that, that a few years before he passed away that uh, said that uh, this book is uh, the, the pointing out the hypocrisy the, of the rich countries, which are saying, do as I say, not as I did, you know? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. There we go. Well, you know, so you reference a lot the Asian tigers. Mm -hmm. In particular, you, you reference uh, Korea, yeah. right? Which, of course, you have firsthand experience of, of the Korean story. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people um, don't realize how poor Korea actually oh, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. right? And even compared to countries like the Philippines, absolutely. Right? Yeah. I mean, Korea was 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 really dirt poor. Yep. And the the policies that that they used to, um, you know, escape from that poverty were, were certainly not ones that would be endorsed today by, you know, the 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 IMF or exactly. the World yeah. Bank, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. That that that. In 1961, the Korea's uh, per capita income was uh, ninety dollars. Yeah. In the same year. The Philippines at uh, two hundred dollars. It was actually the second richest nation in Asia. In the same year, the the, the Ghana had uh, hundred and ninety dollars uh, per capita income. Senegal had uh, three hundred and fifty dollars, or was it uh, three hundred and twenty? Yeah, thereabout. Yeah. So it was actually one of the poorest countries in the world. I mean, the, the, I was uh, born in nineteen sixty-three. Uh, in that year, the Korea's uh, life expectancy was uh, fifty-three years old. Yeah? Uh, sorry, fifty-three years. Yeah, you know, according you're, to that, I should you're be already, dead. You already, already beat it. Yeah, already exactly. Beat it. I beat it uh, by the uh, uh, seven years. Yeah, I'm going to turn the 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 sixty this year. So, you know, it was uh, one of the poorest countries, and yeah, the, there was no way that they could uh, the directly compete with the, the foreign the, the companies that uh, given the, the low level of uh, the uh, its uh, technology and the, the skills. So yes, I mean it uh, started with uh, the lowest of the lowest. Yeah, I mean uh, we were making wigs uh, for American ladies. Yeah, I mean uh, apparently at the time technology was uh, such that you had to plant each strand of uh, hair onto whatever you uh, put on the, the, uh, when you are wearing a wig, and uh, it could be done only in the cheapest uh, labor country, which uh, the, uh, Korea was uh, one of. Yeah. And uh, we were the, the making stuffed toys uh, for American the department stores. We were making uh, the, uh, trainers. You know, at uh, one point in the, yeah, this was actually in the 80s, uh, the, much later than the, the, when the Korea started this uh, development trajectory in the early 60s. Uh, the, in the 80s, uh, at one point, Nike was uh, manufacturing 90% of its shoes in Korea. Huh? Yeah. So it was. I, bought, I, I remember. I remember buying Korean sh sneakers when I was a kid. Exactly. Like, yeah. Uh, Osaka. I think yeah. Osaka was the name of this. Uh, uh, uh. So that 
But, uh, you know, the, it started like that, but uh, it uh, had a uh, big ambition. Uh, so it uh, the, the slowly moved into higher productivity, higher technology industries. And in order to make them work, uh, the, it uh, provided uh, the, the very strong uh, trade protection, you know, subsidized uh, bank loans uh, from, uh, well, I mean, at the time, but uh, basically all the banks were the, the owned by the government. And that uh, a lot of other support in terms of uh, research and development, you know, export marketing, worker training. Yeah, so the, 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 the most uh, dramatic example is that uh, the Korean car company Hyundai, which uh, the, is now quite uh, the, uh, prevalent uh, the, even in the US. I mean, the, now it's uh, the third largest uh, the auto manufacturer in the world. You know, when the Hyundai the, the started this, uh, the, well, production of its uh, own model, because uh, before that it was uh, importing this uh, Ford model, then kids. kind of, yeah, uh, the, the putting together this uh, knockdown kits, yeah. But uh, the, when it uh, started this, uh, the production of its uh, first uh, the, uh, own model in 1976, it uh, produced uh, 10,000 cars, yeah. In the same year, Ford produced 1.9 million cars. General Motors uh, produced 4.8 million. So the, 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 it was uh, producing 0.5% uh, of Ford, 0.2% of uh, General Motors. Yeah? So just imagine if I took a time machine, went back to 1976 and told people, look, uh, there's this uh, two-bit car company which uh, produces 0.5% uh, of Ford, 0.2% uh, uh, of uh, uh, the, the General Motors in this uh, the low middle income country called uh, Korea, but give it uh, just over the, the, the three years, uh, the, the, it will be bigger than Ford. In less than 40 years, it will be bigger than the General Motors. I mean, they would have put me in a mental institution. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no way this uh, could have happened uh, the, if you uh, looked at it uh, from the vantage point of view of uh, 1976. Yeah? But uh, this uh, happened. I mean, of course, uh, partly because the company invested so heavily in developing technologies and uh, training workers, but that uh, also that uh, it uh, happened only because uh, the government uh, completely banned the importation of any foreign cars until 1988, and banned the importation of uh, Japanese cars, that, uh, which were particularly kind of uh, overlapping with uh, Korean cars at the time, until 1998, yeah? And that uh, that it uh, that gave a huge amount of uh, subsidies, uh, especially for export uh, to the car company and other companies. And yeah, I mean that uh, that this is uh, in a way that uh, a uh, more refined and aggressive version of Hamilton's theory. So once so again, I mean that 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 this uh, that uh, the experience of Korea really that. Uh, uh, proves uh, that uh, you need a combination of uh, private sector entrepreneurship and uh, government industrial policy to have uh, on the, the successful economy. And that, uh, that uh, my kicking the ladder shows that uh, that is actually the trajectory that almost all the countries travel you know, in order to get uh, where they are, the, almost all the rich countries of today, sorry, that travel uh, in order to get uh, where they are today. You know? Well, now, Korea is not... Uh, run like that anymore. No, like no. Korea m more closely mm -hmm. resembles uh, uh, like a European or American country in That's terms right. of its balance of, you know, what you might think of as central planning and, yeah. and the market. Yeah. Um, and so if, if, if there's a different kind of medicine for the adult and, and the child, right? You know, why exactly, then do yeah. we, do we, why then do we continue? Why then do we want to administer adult medicine to children? I mean, if we look at a country like Argentina, uh -uh. for instance, you know, they've, they've tried import substitution. Mm -hmm. They've tried a lot of this stuff. Yeah. And I think that, you know, if you're um, part of the Washington consensus, mm -hmm. you would point to Argentina yeah. rather than pointing to Korea uh -uh. and say, look, this is why you don't want to do this stuff, right? Exactly. Yeah. How, would, how would they explain the, the, the differences and, and yeah. how would they explain the Korean story? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as uh, for the kind of uh, universal the prescription the, of the same drug uh, to everyone, I think uh, that's uh, the, the, actually not an accident. That comes from this uh, the view that economics is an exact science, yeah? So that, you know, 
whether it's uh, the, the Ghana or the, the United States, uh, free trade is good. Yeah. Well, free trade is good actually the, in the short run for everyone. Yeah. Trouble is that, that, that if you keep doing free trade, I mean, the, the, the economically backward countries will be basically stuck uh, where they are. Yeah. Just imagine, I mean, if uh, the Korean government liberalizes uh, the automobile market in the 1977, yeah. I mean, Hyundai would have been wiped out overnight, yeah? So, you know, you, you need uh, that different medicine for different people. But uh, since uh, the, the most uh, economists uh, these days uh, believe that there's only one correct policy for everyone, they keep uh, giving the wrong uh, medicine. You know, in the, in the 1960s and 70s, Per capita income in the Latin America grew at 3.1% per year. In the next 40 years, it grew at 0.8%, despite all these good policies of uh, trade liberalization, you know, the privatization of state-owned enterprises and so on. You know, the, the, in the 60s and 70s, per capita income in Africa grew at uh, the rate of 1.6%. Okay, I mean, quite low compared to Latin America, not to speak of East Asia, which uh, the, 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 during that period grew at uh, 6% per year. Well, 1.6% is uh, not a joke, you know, the, that's uh, the actually slightly higher than the rate at which uh, Britain grew during the so-called Industrial Revolution. Yeah? In the next uh, 40 years, uh, per capita income growth in Africa collapsed to 0.3% uh, per year, yeah? which means that uh, the, the, at the end of that uh, 40 year period, Per capita income in Africa was uh, only 6% higher than what it was in 1980. You know, China used to grow at that, uh, that much uh, in half a year, you know. It's a that, uh, total that, uh, failure, but unfortunately, the, the, the so-called uh, uh, Washington institutions uh, the, have failed to see this. I mean, now I think that uh, there, there's a recognition that, that, that it at least that uh, hasn't worked as well as uh, they thought uh, it would. And yeah, especially the International Monetary Fund, uh, I see uh, has become uh, rather more critical of what uh, it used to do. That, uh, so it's a that, uh, positive development, but uh, you know, that this is stemming from this idea that uh, there's only one correct policy because the economics is science, you know, mm. that, that you cannot have a uh, different kind of uh, the economics uh, for different countries, right? uh, which is uh, the deeply the, the troubling. Now, yes, uh, the, the, like everything, you know, the, this kind of uh, the, the, the development model has failed uh, the, in many countries, but uh, that's uh, in the nature of things, no? I mean, the, the, we tell people, yeah, you should uh, study hard, uh, go to university, and then that uh, you will have a uh, better life, yeah. Well, lots of people that uh, that uh, uh, go to university and uh, don't have a better life, but that uh, that doesn't prove that uh, people still that uh, shouldn't go to universities uh, because that uh, you know that, that these guys must have done something wrong, yeah. So if you look at the uh, countries like Argentina, their biggest mistake was uh, that, uh, to believe that uh, they could just uh, the, uh, live off uh, the. the it's basically second-rate technology you know, by uh, protecting their industries. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You cannot do that. I mean, you have to uh, the keep uh, the, the up with uh, the international technologies. So in Korea, even though there was a lot of protection, the protection was uh, the, in order that you raise uh, your companies to keep up with the global standard, yeah? which is actually the idea of uh, infant industry protection. Yeah? It's uh, not the uh, infant interest uh, protection is uh, not saying that you should uh, protect forever, yeah? Cut uh, the ties with uh, the rest of the world, yeah? Then you become North Korea. Yeah? Infant industry protection is uh, uh, saying that you should uh, 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 do this exactly in order that your producers can become world class, yeah? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Argentina and the many other the developing countries that the, failed to have that goal. And also the, when they were implementing these policies, they didn't discipline the recipients of uh, the, the protection and subsidies as much as uh, the Korea or the Japan did. Yeah? Because you had to deliver in terms of uh, the export performance, uh, productivity growth, you know, 
uh, investment in that uh, research and development in countries like uh, Korea, Taiwan, and Japan. Yeah, in many con uh, the other developing countries, uh, the, these uh, the protection and subsidies became uh, free uh, became freebies basically. Yeah, you get all this uh, support and then the, the, uh, you don't perform and then the, the, you keep asking for for the subsidies. Yeah. So uh, they, uh, they look uh, similar, but uh, there were some very big uh, important differences. So, you know, the, do it right, you know, that's uh, the answer. Yeah? Rather than saying, you know, since uh, the, some people, actually probably even majority of people who yeah, uh, went to university didn't uh, make it to the top, but uh, everyone should uh, stop going to university. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Well, I think even within the neoclassical paradigm, people have begun to appreciate, certainly in the world of development, the importance of institutions, exactly, right? Yeah. So whether it's courts and property mm -hmm. rights and, uh, you know, intellectual property and rule of law and, and so forth. Um, and, you know, without those, then a lot of the policies fail. Mm -hmm. But but I think your, your point is that um, to think that those are preconditions and you have to have them kind of well-established before growth can happen, I, I think your, your, your point is that in, in some sense, those are more a consequence of growth than a, than a cause of That's growth. That's right, yeah. No, no, the, the, yeah, this is a the very the kind of uh, complicated and uh, delicate uh, matter, but, uh, you know, the, of course, uh, you need uh, some basic institutions, you know, of uh, property and uh, governance and so on the, the, for uh, the economy to function at all. So if you have, uh, I don't know, the country ruled by warlords or, the, you know, the country where the government doesn't even the control the, 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 the half of its uh, territory, then, the, yeah, you cannot have development. But, you know, the, the, uh, unfortunately, the people have uh, the, the pushed this uh, the, too far and the, the started saying that you need to first uh, reform the institutions then you will grow, yeah? But, I mean, the, this is, uh, the, you know, once again, the, 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 you, you have to the, read the people like, uh, you know, Veblen and Commons and, I mean, even Marx and uh, Hayek uh, to understand that the institutions do not change uh, the, like that, yeah? I mean, the, it takes uh, the, the resource, uh, it takes uh, time, it takes uh, the, the changes in the people's behavior for these uh, institutions uh, the, to work. So, I mean, the, you cannot uh, say that, well, we'll wait until the institutions uh, develop, yeah? Because, yeah, it's a bit like, I don't know, the, you are in a the long distance uh, car race, yeah? Your car is uh, secondhand, outdated, yeah? So are you going to then the, the park the car in one place and the, the, the basically live there for the next uh, 30 years until you collect enough money to, to buy a new car. No, I mean, that way that you will never that, 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 uh, succeed in the race, yeah? I mean, you have to that, that, that drive this car, but that somehow find a way to, you know, to improvise, you know, to, to improve bits and pieces with a li little bit of money that you might have uh, made that, that while uh, the, everyone else was uh, sleeping, you know, the, or the, maybe, yeah, you can the, the, you know, stop for a few days uh, to do some uh, seasonal the, labor the, to collect a bit of money to buy a new, the, I don't know, the, the brake pad. So the, the, you have to the, the, take it in a the more pragmatic way. I mean, I the, 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 am often described as an institutionalist the economist, and uh, I, I believe that the institutions are the, the extremely important, but, you know, this view that somehow you have to have uh, a Cadillac uh, before you can even start a race, I think is uh, that the, the putting the, the cart uh, before the horse, uh, so to speak. Partly because, uh, as you the, the implied, the, the, there's a two-way causality, yeah? I mean, the institutions, of course, uh, help economic development, but uh, with economic development, you can afford to have uh, better institutions, yeah? because uh, mm -hmm. these institutions are costly to run. You know? I mean, uh, if you want to protect uh, property rights, you need a uh, proper uh, court system. Yeah? You need uh, all the, 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 the kind of uh, records office. Yeah? You need uh, the, the, uh, the police. You, know, the, the, you need uh, a lot of resources uh, the, to run these things uh, properly. So the you know the economic development actually helps you have better institutions. Yeah, 
So that, that you need to the, kind of the, the, the consider that the causality as well as, you know, that there being that, that no, you know, time that to sit in one place for 30 years and that, 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 try to earn money to buy a Cadillac. Yeah? You have to somehow you know, drive your that, that second rate tin can car while you know, keeping improving the car that, during the race. I think it takes us back to the notion of linkages, right? Mm-mm. So, you know, when we think of linkages in development economics, we're usually thinking about, you know, linkages between industries, but but there's a linkage between the private sector and the public sector, right? Between Absolutely, the institutions yeah. and the yeah. and the industry. Yeah. Um, well, I want to I want to end with this discussion of, of edible economics because mm-hmm. you said in the book that um, you know when you were a kid, your mom wouldn't even let you in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, well, so, my mom uh, did, but uh, most uh, Korean moms wouldn't. Yeah. So, so how did you start? How did you start cooking? How did that? Uh-uh. Uh, I mean, you know, when you were in England, you you realized that if you were gonna if you're gonna have anything tasty, you had to do, do it yourself. <laughs> That's right? right. Yeah, yeah. No, it, uh, you know, my mom was uh, not super conservative, so uh, I could do some very basic things like you know making sandwiches, uh, fried rice. Yeah, but yeah, of course, I mean the the, the most uh, Korean the the men of uh, my generation. I mean, they never cook uh, the the. I mean, the set the, the food in the kitchen. The the, the uh, in their life uh, the. So yeah, when I moved to the Britain, the, yeah, I, I mean, the food was so horrible. I mean, I had to do something because, uh, the, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that the, you know, the, when you're in your twenties, you know, you can deal with a lot of bad food, you know, that because you are hungry all the time. And but uh, yeah, the, there's a limit uh, the, the <laughs> to what I could take. Uh, so yeah, I the, the started uh, recreating some of the dishes uh, that my mom used to cook and. So I slowly uh, developed uh, my cooking skill, but uh, the real change came when I got married. Uh, the seven years after the, I the, moved to Britain, the, my wife uh, uh, arrived uh, the, to join me in the, the Cambridge, uh, where I was uh, teaching then. And she couldn't believe that I had uh, a dozen cookbooks that, uh, that from which I never cooked. <laughs> because I loved uh, reading cookbooks. Yeah, So she said, well, if you're not going to cook from this, I'm going to throw them away. So the, I the, sprang into action and I started uh, the, the using these cookbooks. And yeah, I realized that I really love cooking. I mean, I find it that uh, very therapeutic, you know. Yeah. So the, I I the, the started the, 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 the kind of uh, experiment, experimenting with various food. And then I also, the, given the nature of my work, I the, the started uh, traveling a lot to foreign countries, you know, especially you know the Mexico, Brazil. I mean, the, I I encountered so many different foods there, and yeah, I mean that I I the, the became even more the interested in the cooking mm-hmm. and the, the the eating and the food in general. And the, the, yeah, I mean that thirty years later we have this book. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's interesting about cooking from my perspective is that, um, you know, each cuisine has sort of its own logic, Mm-mm. right? So, you know, sometimes, you know, people ask me what, what I like to cook and I love Italian, I love French, Mm-mm. I like Turkish, I like Persian, whatever. So they each have their own coherent logic. But if, you know, if you're not a purist about it, then you can, you can kind of, you know, arbitrage ideas across these, Mm-mm. these different uh, schools. And, and right. it made me think about how you think about economics and the different schools of economics. Now, if if you took all of those schools and you just blended it together, then you just have like a big mishmash, and it wouldn't really be too. No, it didn't work. Uh, it didn't work. Right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, but on the other hand, you know, if you're a purist, uh, and, and I know, like you know, in, in places like Italy, yeah. they're very purist. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Yeah. You, you you can't you can't put onions in an amatriciano. Right. You know, you can't yeah. put cheese on fish, and they're very very dogmatic. Exactly, but yeah. when you come to America. Or in the UK, as yeah. you mentioned, it's like, well, you know, let's yeah. let's do like Korean Mexican. Or something, exactly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No. Actually, uh, there's this uh, very interesting uh, the, the uh, restaurant called Korean Dinner Party, uh, which uh, mm-hmm. in London, uh, which uh, which is uh, run by two chefs, uh, and from their name, I can see the ones uh, the Latino, uh, Latina, the, and uh, uh, the others are Chinese, and uh, they do basically fusion of. Uh, Korean and Mexican mm-hmm. food, you know, the, it's great. Yeah, yeah, but that uh, you know that uh, you're right. I mean, if you are not 
if you don't fully understand the idioms of uh, each cuisine, I mean, your attempt to create fusion will end up as a uh, dog's breakfast. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> not actually very e uh, easy yeah. to create a uh, fusion food because uh, you really need to understand these uh, different schools of cooking well before you can actually say, yeah, actually we can lift this part and transport it uh, to another uh, cuisine and then make it work. Yeah. So that's uh, sometimes it's uh, brilliant, sometimes it's uh, the, not so good. Yeah. So do you, do you think we can change the way um, economics is is taught? I mean, you know, I can imagine a PhD program where in your first year, instead of just jumping right into, you know, uh, you know, micro and mm -hmm. game theory and so forth, you know, and econometrics, you know, we we could have something like a maybe a survey course where you you get exposed to these different different schools. That's right. Yeah. Or you know, do you think that would be be helpful in, in yeah. seeding, you know, new new approaches sure. and and uh, and more? Yeah, no, actually, this is how it used to be taught. Yeah, you know, in the mid nineteen eighties, when I was at, at, uh, trying to choose uh, my graduate uh, the course, you know, all the well, not maybe not literally all, but almost all the American economics department in their PhD program had at least one of the uh, history of economic thought yeah, yeah. and economic history as a compulsory paper. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I mean, some universities uh, demanded both. Yeah, yeah so it, yeah. Uh, that, this kind of uh, that, uh, the, the knowledge about uh, the history of the subject, the uh, major debates, uh, you know, ma uh, main differences uh, between the different schools, it used to be a requirement, yeah? the, well, not just an you option. Yeah? You couldn't staff them nowadays because exactly you know, that's the you, trouble. You need, to, you, you need to staff it with a specialist, yeah. and and those specialists, they those gone. specializations yeah. have 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 kind of disappeared. Exactly, but yeah. but if you made if you made somebody who is a specialist in say, um, you know, applied micro, mm -hmm. you know, rotate through that course, mm -hmm. it, it could it could potentially help them to to generate new new ideas for for their work. Yeah, right? and that uh, you could also. Uh, co-teach, you know, I mean, that uh, maybe that uh, you recruit, uh, uh, say, the macroeconomists and uh, microeconomists and development economists and uh, the, try to mm -hmm. kind of uh, ask them to the teach uh, certain schools that uh, they have mm -hmm. uh, better knowledge of, uh, maybe not that, that, that they subscribe to the schools, but at least uh, that they'll be able to. Yeah, so I think that, uh, you know, that, that when, the, I mean, I in the last uh, the, 10 years at least I've been campaigning with uh, university students uh, in Britain, in the US, in Brazil and uh, the, a few other countries to promote uh, uh, what we call the pluralism in economics. Yeah? So we are asking universities uh, to teach this other stuff. Yeah? Okay, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that there can be one dominant school, but at least uh, tell people that there are these other ways of thinking about it. Yeah? at least hire some faculty who do the things differently. I mean, we have uh, the, made the, the, the little the, the inroad, uh, but, uh, you know, it, that uh, we keep uh, banging at the door. And, yeah, when you do that, actually, the, you will the, the create the, the more kind of a diverse the, the way of uh, understanding the world, and I think it will uh, make the subject uh, better the, rather than worse. Unfortunately, when we asked uh, for that, uh, the typical response is, well, we haven't got time, yeah? Mm -hmm. I mean, that uh, we have uh, limited space in the timetable, uh, the, yeah, the curriculum, and uh, we cannot teach all this other stuff, yeah? Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I think uh, that's uh, the, the rather the, the feeble excuse, because, uh, the, you know, A, the, you can make room, yeah? I mean, that the, 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 the economics uh, students are spending so much time doing math, you know, I mean, the, the, now, especially with the development of uh, artificial intelligence, that uh, probably that the modeling isn't uh, going to be a very useful skill. That uh, so chat GPT, right? Exactly, right, solve yeah. your problems, so, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, that uh, you you uh, cut down on some of the, the other things that are, in the, my view, overdone. And also, the, we are not uh, saying that you know the old schools have to have uh, equal, you know, the, the time, you know. I mean, yeah, at least a uh, history of economic thought or, the, you know, 
one or two the, the courses uh, that cover institutionalist uh, economics or the, the Keynesian economics uh, the, rather than the standard micro macro the econometrics uh, kind of setup. But, uh, you know, the, the, basically these are excuses because uh, the, these people don't want to do that. You know? mm -hmm. So the, let's hope that the, the more economists uh, see sense in the, the, these uh, the demands and the uh, make uh, economics uh, a bit uh, the more diverse, uh, a bit uh, richer in understanding. Well, Hajun, thanks so much for joining me. This new book called Edible Economics, you know, if if, if there were still physical bookstores, I'm not really sure where, <laughs> which which shelf they would put this on, right? You know, the economics or, or food. And now I got to figure out what shelf I'm going to put it on. Uh, but also this one, Economics User's Guide, this is actually this is a really fun book, and and uh, and, I, and I hope uh, more and more people will will go and and, and check it out, thank and you. of course all all the older books. Um, so appreciate joining me. Hopefully, I'll see you again sometime soon. Yeah, thank you, Greg. This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.